In 1913, while searching for crew members to accompany him on his quest to become the first man to cross Antarctica from sea to sea via the South Pole in what was named the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, the great British explorer Ernest Shackleton reportedly took out an advertisement in the London Times which read, and I'm quoting, Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton for Burlington Street. (laughs) It doesn't seem like that would attract many takers. And yet later, Carl Hopkins Elmore quoted Shackleton as saying that so overwhelming was the response to his appeal that it seemed as though all the men of Great Britain were determined to accompany him. So from among them, Shackleton chose 26 of the best men for this epic adventure, now chronicled in a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, titled Endurance, which was the name of their ship. And I've talked about this story here before, the true story of Shackleton and his 27 crew members, 26 whom he chose and one stowaway who sailed to the Antarctic in 1914, where after five months of making their way south, their ship became trapped in pack ice in the Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica. And because their ship was slowly being crushed by the ice, Shackleton and his men had to abandon the endurance, and instead they camped out on the ice floe, drifting aimlessly on open seas for the next 10 months. 10 months helplessly floating on pack ice in one of the most inhospitable places on earth. It's a story of survival unlike any other. Not only were they eating penguins and seals to stay alive, but at one point the crew was attacked by a sea leopard, which was ultimately shot and killed. And after cutting the sea leopard open, the crew found its stomach full of undigested fish, which they later said provided what they described as one of the most delicious meals of the entire journey. (laughs) These men were cut from a different cloth, led by a man who was undauntingly determined to survive. And so after more than a year lost at sea, most of that spent drifting on ice, Shackleton took a handful of his men and sailed in a lifeboat 850 miles across the South Atlantic's heaviest seas in a lifeboat to a remote outpost on the island of South Georgia where not only were they discovered and rescued, but ultimately his entire crew, all 27 men, were rescued. One of his crew members later referred to Shackleton as the greatest leader that ever came on God's earth, bar none. When another crew member was interviewed after the entire ordeal was over, when asked how he compared Shackleton to the other most famous explorers of the time, uh, Robert Falcon Scott being one and Roald Amundsen in the other, the crew member replied, he said, for scientific leadership, give me Scott. For swift and efficient travel, Amundsen. But when you're in a hopeless situation, when there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. As men go, Ernest Shackleton was the picture of strength, and patience, and endurance, and wisdom. Everything that was needed to try and stay alive until they were rescued, but make no mistake about it. If they had not been rescued, all of the grit, and all of the determination, and all of the talent, and wisdom, and ability among them combined would not have been enough to save them, because ultimately these capable and courageous men still had to be rescued. There's another famous story of a man full of strength and patience and endurance and wisdom who along with his family drifted aimlessly on the open seas for a year. A man who despite his every effort to find dry land on his own also had to be rescued. It's the story of course of Noah and the great flood which we're continuing to study today as we complete the story the history of creation. But listen, this is more than just a story about one man and his family being rescued by God. This is the story about all of humanity's desperate need to be rescued by God. In fact, uh, this is our story. 
Because no matter how resourceful or successful or gifted or confident or determined that we may ever be in our own abilities, listen, apart from Jesus Christ, we are nothing more than hopelessly lost people drifting aimlessly through life in desperate need of rescue. Despite the efforts of the men in both of these stories, they knew that without a rescuer, they would never make it. Shackleton, a Christian, in writing years later about his story, told of the final march by himself and two other crew members across the island of South Georgia, where they were ultimately rescued, albeit almost dying on the way. Knowing that God was with them and ultimately that he was responsible for their rescue, Shackleton wrote these words. He said, when I look back at those days, I have no doubt that providence guided us. Not only across those snow fields, but across the storm white sea that separated Elephant Island from our landing place on South Georgia. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions on the point, but afterwards worsely said to me, boss, I had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us. Crean confessed to the same idea. One feels the dearth of human words, the roughness of mortal speech in trying to describe things intangible, but a record of our journeys would be incomplete without a reference to a subject very near to our hearts. Shackleton and his men understood that without God, they would never have made it, and they knew he was with them the whole time. Noah, as we'll see in our story today, understood that without God, they never would have made it, but they knew he was with them the entire time. And we must understand today that without Jesus Christ, your family and your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors and the people you encounter every single day who do not know Jesus will not make it because there's absolutely no other hope for this this world other than Jesus Christ. That means, that means the most hate-filled offense that we could ever commit against another human being is to be indifferent about sharing the gospel with them. The most hateful thing you could ever do is to be indifferent about sharing the gospel with those who are lost. The Apostle John said, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen, 1 John 4, 20. Listen, to know the truth, and yet to withhold that truth, that is the epitome of hatred. We cannot say that we love God while being indifferent about sharing the gospel with those who are lost. So let me just ask you this. If you were walking around in the city with your daughter or your son and somehow you became separated from that child, I mean, just think about the sense of panic, the sense of urgency, the the sense of dread that you would feel as the minutes tick by while you frantically try to find your child, your daughter or your son. But then the minutes turn to hours. And the hours turn to days, and the days turn to weeks, and the weeks turn to months, and the months turn to years. Now I wonder, at what point would you become indifferent about rescuing your lost child? Of course, you don't have to respond, because I know well and good what the answer to that question is. The answer is never. Till the day you died, you would search for that lost child. In fact, it would consume your very life. You would never give up on trying to rescue that daughter or that son. Do you understand that's exactly how Jesus feels about every single lost soul on this planet? And it is exactly how we are supposed to feel about the lost souls we encounter every day. Yet yet we go through our, our daily routines and so often we're indifferent about those around us who are lost and dying, and going to hell. If we're being honest, I think most of the time we're more worried about what we're having for lunch than we are about the soul of the waiter or waitress who's serving it to us. We're more concerned about people's understanding of politics than we are about their understanding of the gospel. 
Most of us spend far more time serving ourselves than we do sharing Jesus with others. Where is our passion for the lost? Where is the urgency? Where is the panic? Where is the dread over every lost soul that is waiting to be rescued? And why aren't we doing everything that we can to lead them to the rescuer? What if Noah thought of himself more than anyone else? I I dare say this story would be very different. We may not even be here. But he did care. He cared intensely about others, enough to spend 500 years of his life preaching the truth to them, enough to spend another 100 years of his life building an ark to save the ones who would listen, and as we'll see today, another year of his life doing everything that he possibly could to keep them alive, to ensure there would be future generations who would also be rescued by God, just like he was. You see, this isn't just Noah's story. This is our story. This is the story of how Jesus rescued us from being hopelessly lost and aimlessly adrift apart from him forever. And it's the story of every human being who will ever be rescued by Jesus in the future, all told through Noah, a man who loved others far more than he loved himself. So let's pick the story back up where we left off last time in this final installment of our sermon series in the beginning and let's see maybe we can gain a better understanding of what it truly means to be rescued we'll start by reading genesis chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 this is at the end of the storm but nowhere near the end of noah's stay on the ark genesis chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 but god remembered noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the water had abated, and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So the rains have stopped, and a full five months after it began uh, to rain, the ark finally comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And Ararat, in the ancient Hebrew, refers to a region called Urartu. It's a kingdom north of Assyria, mentioned in 2 Kings 19.37, also uh, in Isaiah 37.38 and Jeremiah 51.27, which was later called Armenia. It's now part of eastern Turkey and southern Russia and also northwestern Iran. So it's a huge area, spans over 100,000 square miles in fact. And within that area, towering at 17,000 feet, the tallest mountain in the range is Mount Ararat, which actually is not named in the Bible as the mountain where the ark came to rest, just on the mountains, it says, of Ararat, which of course could include the entire region. Nonetheless, Mount Ararat certainly could be where the ark actually landed, and it most definitely is the focus of much of the research and the evidence that we found suggesting the final resting place of the ark. Either way, there's a more important story at play here uh, because there's a tremendous amount of imagery in this chapter that is directly intended to point us to the gospel. Okay, first of all, the seventh month in the Hebrew religious calendar was known as Tishri. It's the most important month of the sacred convocations, which included the Day of Atonement, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Sacred Assembly as outlined in Leviticus 23, 23 through 26, which is significant because the ark, a symbol of God's provision and atonement, is completing its journey the very same month as the feast that would later represent God's provision and atonement, all of which points to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross when he rescued humankind once for all. Secondly, all of chapters 6 through 9 echo chapters 1 through 3. Right? When the people and the animals disembark later in this chapter and are commanded to be fruitful and multiply on the earth, in verse 17, that's a mirror image of the command by God in chapter 1, both to the animals and to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. When verse 1 here in chapter 8 says that God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided, the word wind that was blowing over the waters is the ancient Hebrew word ruach, which means spirit, and happens to be the exact same word used in chapter 1 verse 2, which says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit. 
Spirit of God, Ruach, was hovering over the face of the waters. And then in verse 5, we see the mountains, dry land, appearing out of the water, just as in chapter 1, verse 9, where the dry land appears from the waters in the creation story. And then again, in verse 1 here in chapter 8, when it says God remembered Noah, that word remembered is the Hebrew word zakar. Uh, it doesn't actually mean remembered in the way that we think of that word today. In other words, uh, God didn't forget about Noah and now he's remembering, oh yeah, this guy's stuck somewhere in a giant boat out in the sea. No, when that word zakar, remembered, is used in scripture uh, to refer specifically to God, remembering someone, it's used, by the way, in that context 18 times in the Old Testament. That's actually covenant language that it indicates the fact that God is getting ready to act on someone's behalf. So when he says God remembered, no, he's getting ready to act on his behalf, just as he did with Adam in the creation story. In fact, that word remembered in the Jewish culture was a Hebrew idiom. It was a saying that meant began again to act on their behalf. In other words, something really good is getting ready to happen. And what happens is the earth and its inhabitants are rescued by God. It's a great foreshadowing, again, of the work of Christ in rescuing the world. In fact, the ark itself was in many ways a foreshadowing of the Christ. The ark brought salvation to mankind. Jesus brought salvation to mankind. The ark suffered through a great struggle, the storm. Jesus suffered through crucifixion. And finally, when its mission to save mankind was completed, the ark came to rest on the 17th day of the month, according to verse 4. And interestingly enough, when Jesus completed his work of salvation, he rose from the dead on the 17th day of the month, according to the Jewish religious calendar. You see, everything that God did for Noah points directly to what Jesus did for you and for me. Which means just as God remembered Noah, just as God was getting ready to do something great for Noah, God remembers you. He acted on your behalf by sending his son Jesus Christ to die your death, to rescue you from the punishment, the death that you deserved. He rescued you from his own wrath just as Noah was rescued from God's wrath. And listen, people talk today all the time about being saved from their sins, about being saved from themselves, about being saved from the devil, about being saved from hell. Listen, there's something far more terrible than all of those things combined. And that is the wrath of God. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Apostle Paul said, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of of God, Romans 5, 9. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, he said, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from what? From the wrath to come. He's talking about the wrath of God. John the Baptist said, whoever believes in the son is eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him, John 3, 36. And in his vision of the second coming of the Christ, the apostle John describes Jesus saying from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the almighty, Revelation 19, 15. You see, Without Jesus Christ, we remain under the wrath of God, hopeless, lost, aimlessly drifting through life in desperate need of rescue. But through Jesus Christ, God remembers us. It is a future promise that runs like a thread throughout all of Scripture until the moment he submitted his life to the Father on a Roman cross for you and for me when that promise became a reality. Right? You understand this. Before Jesus' atoning work on the cross, before Jesus died and, and rose from the dead, when people died, they didn't go to heaven. Both the righteous and the unrighteous went to a place the Bible calls Sheol. As Jacob points out concerning the righteous in Genesis 37, 35, also with Samuel in 1 Samuel 28, 13 and 14, as well as the unrighteous, as David explains in Psalm 31, 17. And that's just three examples, by the way, for the sake of time. This is taught throughout all of the Old Testament. And we know from Jesus in Luke's gospel that Sheol was a place divided into two halves, Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom or paradise, depending uh, on the translation you're reading, where the righteous were sent, which was not heaven, 
and then the other half, Hades or hell, where the wicked were sent in constant torment, and between the two was fixed a great chasm. All of this according to Jesus, who said in Luke 16, 19 through 26, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He was looking at them. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Okay, all of this is taking place in Sheol, which is why Jesus said it is written in the prophets. And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Jesus is talking about himself. John 6, 45 and 46. He said, no one has seen the Father at this point, but me. No one has seen the Father, but me. Why would Jesus say that? What about all the good God-fearing people who died before Jesus came? Well, it's because this was before the crucifixion. And before the crucifixion, everyone who died went to Sheol, either to the half that was Abraham's side, or paradise, or to Hades, the place of torment, both in Sheol. It was in the heart of the earth, by the way, as Jesus describes in Matthew 12, 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now we're going to come back to this story about Sheol as we go because it actually parallels the story of Noah. But the point for now is there was a lot more happening between the crucifixion and the resurrection that usually gets talked about or taught in church. Jesus didn't just die, hang out in the grave for three days and then come back to life. No, that entire time he was rescuing people, as we'll see. Okay, the depths that Jesus, the, the perfect Son of God, willingly descended into to rescue us from the wrath of God that every one of us deserves is nothing short of breathtaking. And the moment he died, the first thing he does is remember those in Sheol. And so he goes there. Now look, he's already descended to the earth from heaven. He's already descended into the form of a man. He's already descended to death on a cross and all of this for us. And now he's descending into Sheol to set those who belong to him, the Old Testament saints, free, as we'll see. When scripture says that God remembered Noah, who was captive on that boat, he's pointing us directly to the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, who remembered us on the cross, who remembered the captives in Sheol, and who remembers all those who are lost today, honestly. I mean, how can we go through life and not tell every single lost soul we meet about what Jesus has done? Before Christ, we're all drowning in the wrath of God. But the moment we accept him as Lord of our lives, he remembers us and he rescues us. And if that isn't worth telling others about, well, well then I don't know what is. By the way, as wonderful as this is, the story gets even better. Let's keep reading verses 6 through 12. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. And then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So Noah, clearly he's a smart guy. He sends out these birds as a way of uh, determining whether or not the floodwaters had receded, and if so... 
to what extent. And it's interesting that there's no mention of Noah simply asking God if the waters had receded yet. So instead he uses the intellect, of course, and the resources that God has given him to try and discern the truth. And honestly, I think that is the point of this part of the story. We, we know, of course, that Noah knew God, right? He, he communicated with God. But for those who are lost and yet searching for truth, they don't know to ask God, at least not until someone tells them. And so in the meantime, what do we do? We use our intellect and resources available to us to try and discern what is true. Listen, this is why sound doctrine and good biblical theology is so important and also why it is critical to the lost that as believers we actually proclaim the truth of the gospel the word of God the voice of God which is given to us in the scriptures to those who are lost and in need of rescue that seems like that would be an obvious statement to a bunch of Christians in a church and yet I have literally had Christians tell me that we don't have to verbalize the gospel. We don't actually have to proclaim the gospel message in words as long as we're living it out in our actions, which sounds really nice, but it's not true because there are people from all religions who love other people. There are people from all sorts of backgrounds and religions and beliefs, belief systems who treat other people with dignity and respect and love, which is good, of course, we should do that. But listen, treating people with dignity and respect and love without telling them about Jesus Christ will not lead them to Jesus Christ. If anyone could have shown the love of Jesus without using words, surely it was Jesus and yet Jesus himself said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea, Luke 4, 43 and 44. Yes, of course we must treat people with dignity. Yes, we must show people respect. Yes, we must share the love of Christ everywhere we go. But without the proclamation of the gospel, it will never be enough to lead people to Christ. It will never be enough to rescue those who are lost because it is the voice of God alone that calls us out of captivity and into freedom, as we're going to see. Let's keep reading verses 13 through 19. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So a year after they enter the ark, Noah and his family are finally free from their captivity. And again, I think it's telling that even though Noah knew the waters had receded, he didn't take one step off of that boat until God called him out nearly two months later. What a day that must have been. The fresh air, the open skies, the world made clean, a whole new beginning for the earth and a whole new life for Noah as God sets him free from the captivity of the ark. It is a stunning picture of the new life that you experience when God sets you free, which again is what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it is what he did for all those in captivity when he descended into Sheol. The apostle Peter said, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. So Jesus preached the truth to all those in Sheol on both sides of the chasm, including all those who rejected the truth all the way back in Noah's day. But he did more than that, as the apostle Paul explains. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended 
What does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. So Jesus descended into the lower regions of the earth, Sheol, and after proclaiming the truth to them, he led a host of captives, all those in Abraham's side, to heaven. He gave gifts to men. You, you understand, Jesus rescued them from their captivity which was the fulfillment of the promise of God for the Old Testament saints and all those who would ever believe in and follow Jesus Christ after that because he sets you free from everything in this world that would ever try to hold you captive. Okay, when you belong to Jesus, sin can no longer control you. The world can no longer deceive you and death can no longer defeat you. This is the freedom we have when Jesus rescues us and it is the freedom that all those who are lost don't even know is possible. But how could they know if we don't tell them? Honestly, how can we enjoy the freedom that we have in Christ and at the same time be content to watch others remain in captivity? How can we say we love God if we're not willing to suffer a little discomfort a little awkwardness, a little uncertainty by sharing the freedom that we have with those who are still bound up in sin? Are we so busy that we can't be bothered by sharing the gospel or are we too afraid of what might happen if we do? I'll just tell you this, our fear of what happens to those without Christ must be greater than our fear of what might happen to us when we share Christ with them. Maybe we think we can afford to take the time and, and effort. We can't afford to take the time and effort to witness to lost people. I'm telling you, we cannot afford not to. There's too much at stake. There's too much to lose when we remain silent. Noah led every living thing off of that ark once God called him to come out. And if you've been rescued by Christ, it is your job to do the very same thing to every lost soul who will listen. Let's finish our story for today. Verse 20 to the end of the chapter. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So appropriately, the first thing that Noah does after disembarking and leading the others off of the ark is to build an altar and worship the Lord, to which God responds with a promise. Even though he knows that the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth, he promises never again to curse the ground, never again to destroy every living creature as long as the earth remains. And then he institutes the seasons, which would have, by the way, uh, profound ecological and climactic changes on the earth as the vapor barrier that covered the earth, which we've already talked about in previous chapters, has now been emptied out in the flood. So in other words, no more a 900 year lifespans. And of course, we see evidence of mass extinctions of animals in the fossil record, which would make sense after the flood because of the dramatic changes in the earth's climate and exposure to the elements that it hadn't known before, it, certainly at least uh, not to this extent. It's worth noting, by the way, that the fertility religions of the ancient Near East attributed the changing of the seasons to the ongoing actions of the gods. So in Canaanite religion, for example, the onset of spring was seen as the result of Baal's liberation from the underworld, which was ruled by Mot, or death. And so the powers of the earth and the powers of the gods were believed to interact with one another, bringing about changes in the seasons, whereas biblical religion attributes the changing of the seasons to the command of Yahweh, the word of God, period. In other words, there is no mother earth. Only Father God, who dictates to the earth every breath of wind, every crashing wave, every drop of rain, every falling snow, every withered leaf, every single sunrise, and every evening's sunset by his divine word alone. It was part of the covenant that he made with Noah here in chapter 8 and in the first half of chapter 9. And so Noah was not only rescued, but he was rescued with a promise 
And listen, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ today, he doesn't just rescue you. No, God rescues you with a promise, a covenant promise. And there's no more powerful picture of that promise than Jesus hanging on a cross while a thief, a wretched sinner, hangs next to him gasping for air. And in those final moments of his miserable life, he believes in Jesus Christ and confesses him as Lord. And in that moment, Jesus made that man a covenant promise. Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43, paradise. Abraham's side, Abraham's bosom. Jesus didn't say, today you'll be with me in the presence of the Father, or today you'll be with me in heaven. No, that day he would be with Jesus in Abraham's side with the rest of the Old Testament saints as Jesus preached to the captives and then later led a host of them, including that thief, to heaven where we all go now when we die, when we're in Christ. Because when Jesus rescues a human soul, it comes with a promise, an eternal promise of never-ending life in abundance, but it's also an earthly promise that he will never leave us or forsake us no matter what we go through on this earth. Listen, that promise is repeated over and over and over again in Scripture that no matter how hard life gets, Jesus is with us. He said to Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you, Joshua 1.5. David said the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I've been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Psalm 37, 23 through 25. The author of Hebrews writes, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, 5. The apostle Paul said, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. Second Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. Every single one of those promises is for our lives on this earth. And yet every single one of them was also made in the context of God's people fulfilling the purpose they were created for. In other words, he's saying, I've rescued you with a promise for a purpose. A purpose beyond your own salvation or your own success. Yes, the promise is for you, but it's bigger than just you. Because I want you to tell others about me so they can be rescued too. And here's the best part. No matter how difficult it gets, no matter how hard this world pushes back against you, even if you have to suffer for it, you don't have to worry or fear because I, Jesus, will never leave you or forsake you. Do you understand? This is what you were rescued for. Not so you can build a great career, not so you can make an impressive income, not so you can have a big house, not so you can live a comfortable life, not so you can gain prominence among your peers. You understand all those desires may be fine in the right context, expressed in the right way, but they have to all get in line behind the desire to make disciples of Jesus Christ first. And yet I'm afraid that all too often the desire to make disciples is anything but first in our lives as we go through our daily routines, so often indifferent about those all around us who are lost and dying and going to hell. Where, where is our passion for the lost? Where's the urgency? Where's the panic? Where is the dread over every lost soul who is yet waiting to be rescued? And why aren't we doing everything that we can to lead them to the rescuer? Honestly, these are questions that should haunt our thoughts and burn in our hearts until something changes. Why? Because there's no more time to waste. 
Ernest Shackleton said, death is a very small thing, the smallest thing in the world. I know that death scarcely weighs in the scale against a man's appointed task. Each one of us has been appointed a task to lead lost souls to the rescuer by telling them about Jesus. That's why we're all here. Yet we've only been given a fixed amount of days on this earth to do just that. Do you really want to waste even one of them? Chasing after something that you can't take with you anyway. A.W. Tozer once said, Life is a short and fevered rehearsal for a concert we cannot stay to give. Just when we appear to have attained some proficiency, we're forced to lay our instruments down. There's simply not enough time to think, to become, to perform what the constitution of our natures indicates we're capable of. Listen, we don't have any more time to waste. Our lives on this earth are too short to be focused on ourselves while people all around us are dying without Jesus Christ. There must be an urgency. There must be a priority. There must be a primacy in our daily lives for those who are lost and in need of rescue because there is no more time to waste. See, these first eight chapters of the Bible, the story, it's the story of humanity and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the story of the beauty of creation and the brokenness of sin. It's the story of the utter hopelessness of being lost and separated from God, and yet the triumph of Christ over death and the rescue of God's people through Jesus Christ. And yet these first eight chapters of the Bible, they're, they're not just the story of an ancient people in an ancient culture these eight chapters are the story of your life the story of how God created you the story of how you sinned and fell short of his perfection how you were lost and drifting aimlessly through life until Jesus came and rescued you this is the story of what Jesus did for you Maybe it's time you shared that story with someone else. Let's pray.